to the 90s, faggots! As the result of what happened recently at WrestleMania 6, the Ultimate Challenge, and its main event, the Ultimate Warrior, has in his possession both the World Wrestling Federation Championship and the Intercontinental title. Now, with that in mind, President Jack Tunney had the following announcement to make this past week. As of April 1st of this year, World Wrestling Federation history was made, with one man holding both the Intercontinental Championship and the World Wrestling Federation title. Since it is obvious that no one man can properly fulfill the requirements of both title defenses at the same time, the Ultimate Warrior has surrendered to me, as of this date, the Intercontinental Championship. I have declared the title vacant and furthermore have ordered that a tournament be held to determine who will become the new Intercontinental Champion. The pairings and participants in the tournament will be announced next week. Thank you. The World Wrestling Federation presents a double main event, the Immortal Old Hogan versus 476 pounds of the Earthquake, plus World Wrestling Federation champion, the Ultimate Warrior, defends against ravishing Rick Rude in the confines of a steel cage. Hello and welcome to OSW Review, the old school wrestling video podcast. Filmed in glorious grapple vision and encoded with blast processing, we chronologically critique the Hulkamania era pay-per-view by pay-per-view. Call up the Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jet. It's the summertime. With a double main event, Jeremy Piven approved, it's the Summerfest. This is your host, the one-man burial squad, Jay Hunter. <laughs> Joining me as ever, wrestling's answer to zig and zag, it's Mr. O.S.C. Hey, buddy. And B1. All right. It's SummerSlam 1990. Take it away, Mean Gene. Who do you call the what? <laughs> <laughs> We kick off with Vince running down the card, a double main event. It's August 27, 1990 from the Philadelphia Spectrum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They don't let us forget it. It's SummerSlam with 19,304 in attendance with 600 comps and a very strong 550,000 watching at home. Commentators tonight are Vince McMahon and Rowdy Roddy Peeper and a mental crowd roars. Steve and Steve, you guys watched the WWE Anthology version? Mine was the WWF Tag Classics version. It was 2 hours 39, you guys? It was, it was about the same, yeah. Same, yeah. Fantastic. You guys... <laughs> <laughs> we'll kick... We'll get straight into it. Get, get the... Get the... Never mind. <laughs> now we've got Vince and Piper on commentary compared to... Mm. It's a big ass change. I was uh, very nervous heading into the show. I was pretty adamant I was going to be annoyed for two and a half hours with these two. Vince, who you know, I, I cannot stand on commentary. Piper, who, yeah, he's okay in small doses, you know, kind of a five minute promo job. Do you want to hear a two and a half hour Piper promo? I can tell you that going into the show, I didn't anyway. And what about our friend Gorilla? Maybe Vince thought that he'd have better chemistry with Roddy Piper. And he can give him on-air notes, as supposed to screaming in his ear. Like, <laughs> he can scream in his face. <laughs> Our opening bout is the Rockers versus Power and Glory, Paul Roma and Hercules with Slick. 
fuck. <laughs> I was really <laughs> angry when I saw him come out. In there, in his little belly top. What the hell was that all about? Him and Roma. This is the first of many surprises on this pay-per-view. A lot has happened since WrestleMania. Hercules is now a heel and he's in a tag team. Do you know any... Uh... I'll give you a bit of a backstage mm. tell on it. So this is Paul Roma's first WWE pay-per-view since episode 6. Survivor Series 87. Was he using the, was it the Wild Stallions? No, not the Wild Stallions. With Jim Powers yeah. called the Young Stallions. Young Stallions. Close enough. He's been a jobber since. So, after dropping to Dino Bravo, the Rockers helped him out of the ring, but he refused help. So, Hercules came out to calm everyone down, but swerve, we're gonna attack the Rockers and beat you up, and now we've got this match. Man, it's a good thing he lost the match, so Hercules would come out and <laughs> parlay the situation. Right? <laughs> the heels Pearl Harbor the faces, and right away, Marty laughs off clubs from Roma. Jesus Christ. <laughs> he's a good athlete, and he's not a bad wrestler, but... Man cannot sell to save his life, and I'm sure that, among with many other things, cost him dearly. Off camera, Sean is apparently injured via Hercules chain attack, and he sells like death. Now, Sean was actually legitimately suffering from a knee injury, and they incorporated it into the match. Oh. Incorporated into the match as in, let's keep kicking his injured knee. Yeah. Because that's what they kept doing. <laughs> it was it was pretty funny. He kept trying to get into the ring, you know, and the real kind of, oh, I'm going to get there. And then somebody would come up and give him a dig and he'd fall back down. It went from rooting for him to, I start laughing at him. This is some strategy, illegally assaulting a wrestler before the bell, but not so much that they can't continue the match. Nice. Yeah, it's clever. Yeah, it's clever. So the match still goes ahead and it's basically a handicap. Huh? Handicap match, yeah. yeah. So the story of this match is the heels smartly double-teaming Marty as Sean is injured at the outside, cutting off whatever hope spots Marty might work for. Power and Glory make short work of Marty two-on-one with an awesome superplex, a top rope splash tag combination, getting the pinfall win at 5.59. I think this is a very good tag team. Yeah, they're put over monster big mm-hmm. here. This is by far the best used of Hercules that we've seen so far. But man, I was angry when I saw him come out. I really was. <laughs> this is 13. Nice. 13 and 0 here. Of a pay-per-view payday for Hercules. And he's not going anywhere, mate. <laughs> <laughs> now, post-match, Sean gets beat down in the ring. And they bring out a stretcher. But ah, fucking cut to the back. Jesus, lads. It's been a bad year for the Rockers. And it doesn't get any better for them. Uh, Sean would actually be replaced in the Rockers on house shows by... Not leave Cassidy. <laughs> Shane Douglas. Oh, God. As the new Rockers, but Sean will be back in time for the Survivor Series. I, I don't think it's really hurt the Rockers at all, the fact that they've had a bad year. They were never... Uh, well, obviously, there's the controversy about them winning the tag titles and all that, but it never looked like they were legitimately going to win the tag titles at any point. Mm. They're just a very entertaining act. They got it right this pay view. They are jerking the curtain, and they made it a really exciting match. I agree with most of that, yeah. Overall, really, really good match. The best opening match I've seen in a good year or so. The best use of uh, Hercules that we've had since WrestleMania 1. And I thought Vince and Piper were pretty good in commentary. They didn't grate on me too much. WrestleMania 2. WrestleMania 2? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Can you say WrestleMania 2? WrestleMania 2. All right. <laughs> Cut to an interview with the new Intercontinental Champion, Mr. Perfect, and his manager, Bobby Heenan. Steve's favourite, the word perfect is said nine times in 40 seconds. <laughs> perfect. 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 Cheers for working that <laughs> Holy fucking shit. <laughs> Heenan scoffs at the Texas Tornado's chances. Mean Gene with newcomer Texas Tornado and they have a little chat. <laughs> Tornado is wearing matching tights, the same tights as perfect. He speaks as if he's an actual tornado. <laughs> as in, I'm going to go in there and turn around really quickly and blow his all away. That's awesome. I think he said he's going to do lots of blow. <laughs> you see, you must not know much about the Texas tornadoes because Mr. Perfect, they're powerful. They're unpredictable. They're devastating. And when our match is over, and the Texas Tornado heads back up into the clouds. I'll be taking with me the Intercontinental Championship belt. Nice. Yeah. I don't remember Tornado's accent at all. He didn't sound very Texas-like. He was almost kind of sound like uh, Beach Bum. 
Yeah, dude, you know that kind of way? Yeah, so yeah. San Dimas, like. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So he comes out and he's heading towards the ring. Shouldn't a tornado do something more exciting than walking slowly? <laughs> I'm always twirling, <laughs> twirling, twirling towards freedom. <laughs> Did you also notice that he had quickly changed his jocks between the promo and coming out? <laughs> very good. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. a very quick change. Maybe he was cold out and he dressed in layers. And... <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, so you can tell that they taped the vignettes earlier in the day. Big and time. he got dressed again and there you go. So we got Mr. Perfect with the perfect manager versus the Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich. Now let us fill you in because Mr. Perfect, he was jobbing to be for at Mania and now he shows up... So in a pre-taped vignette, President Funny Jack Tunney declared that post-WrestleMania 6, WWF and Intercontinental Champion The Ultimate Warrior cannot fulfill the requirements of both title defences at the same time. So Warriors forfeited the Intercontinental belt and he's setting up an eight-man tournament which will be held to crown a new champion. I assume Jack Tunney was some kind of executive in WWF. Yep, Jack Tunney worked for WWF Canada as their local promoter. Okay, could they not have got somebody better to put in front of the fucking camera? Yes, but saying that, he does look like he's actually a businessman, a suit, and this is his actual job because he's got no charisma, if that makes any sense. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll buy it. So, just quick results from that. Santana was in it, and he beat Akeem. How about that? By count out. Perfect got the perfect win, the Valentine foot on the second rope to pin Snooker. <laughs> Piper and Martel, Brawl and Double DQ. Oh, you're joking. Oh, fuck. Who'd have thought it, eh? And Bravo and Beefer get a double count out. So what that really means is the Ariba Man and Mr. Perfect are in the finals. It's what Bobby Heenan doing here. What are you doing? Apparently Bobby's seen enough rule breaking. Coming down to give the ref a piece of his mind. Beautiful move, this could be it. Whoa, wow, that was close. Great wrestling move on the part of Mr. Perfect. You can never count Mr. Perfect out. And Perfect staying within the rules, Santana breaking him flagrantly. Santana now with Perfect, slams him down to the canvas with authority. Here it comes. Wait a minute, get off the apron. Get off the apron. Santana with kicks to the midsection. Perfect again. Wait a minute. No. Two. He's got a hold now. He beat him with the wrestling move. Not breaking the rule once, McMahon. Not like Chico. Perfect reversed the small cradle and got the three and the Intercontinental title. I would have preferred us to have the final on this pay-per-view. I know it's, whatever, three months away, but another fucking title change on some random show. Oh, show, yeah. What if the belt could change hands by double count out? Who'd win it, though? Piper. <laughs> <laughs> Piper and Bad News fighting for it every month. Isn't it? Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich. He's from the famous Von Erich family of world-class championship wrestling in Texas. He's the former NWA world champion. He defeated Ric Flair and was a part of the atrocious Carney main event of Super Clash 3. The AWA champion and the world-class champion. It was Jerry Lawler versus Texas Tornado. Jerry Lawler cut open Kerry Von Erich and then Kerry Von Erich got the claw on him so he's going to win and get the three and then it's like one, two it's like actually no you can't see I'm a DQ DQ Jesus stop oh, the fight God and then Vern Gagne got everyone's paychecks and ran home <laughs> <laughs> and then gave all the belts to Greg <laughs> <laughs> he retired undefeated <laughs> he, he literally did actually the NWA champion comes into the WWF and is put in the mid-card. How, how great was the talent pool? Like, fuck's sake. Completely agree. That was Vince's idea. This was my all-star rosters where everyone else's champions, my mid-card. Nice. Texas Tornado, he debuted at the Saturday Night's main event in July 28th and he challenged Perfect for an IC title shot nine days before SummerSlam. And Perfect said, yeah, why not? Perfectly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, good bit of ska on this. This was supposed to be Beefcake's big title win, but he was in a serious accident on the 4th of July weekend. So he was on a beach and a female parasailer lost control and landed on the beach, smashing her knees into Beefer's face. He required facial reconstruction, so he'd actually be out for two years. Women drivers, eh? <laughs> <laughs> 
Fucking hell, there. Wow. And he, and he comes back with a mask and all that, doesn't he? That's right, very good. Mm. I was wondering, why are you stealing takers, Gimme? <laughs> Did you wrestle Nabel as well? <laughs> <laughs> I loved the tornado as a kid. I wanted to bejewel my bathrobe, <laughs> but my ma had none of it. <laughs> I was like seven. <laughs> the perfect stalling tactics to start us off. Kerry no sells some punches and replies with a slingshot to the ring post, just like the finish of Mania, and employs the claw. And then a discus punch, Perfect sold like he was in a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> and what the fuck? Perfect gets pinned. Tornado is the new intercontinental champion. Holy shit, what the fuck? I thought Perfect had a great title reign. What's this? What's happening? Yeah, that's. it was great to see because I didn't know this was going to happen. No, I had no memory of this at all. Uh, fans were crazy into uh, Tornado. So, perfect job in just 5 minutes 13 seconds. And this was kind of viewed as an upset win that Perfect didn't have time to prepare. And so we underestimated him. I loved Von Eric's Matt Hardy spinning punch. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I thought the match was pretty entertaining. So, good stuff. It doesn't really bother me that Perfect lost. He is mid-card at the moment. He is the Dolph Ziggler of that time. So fuck him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I thought it was an okay match. I, I much preferred the first one. For a title change, I'd want a bit more, but I suppose there's the surprise element. I have to say, five minutes for a title match, that's that's an angle. Um, so this is the high point of Tornado's WWF venture, which isn't actually particularly that long. Oh god, his high point is five minutes into his career. <laughs> this is actually quite an incredulous result having Tornado win the belt as Vince was worried that he'd walk out on him at any time. So post SummerSlam he recorded Perfect beating Tornado in a non-title match that they could use as insurance and just, you know, fob off, oh this is the title change. So it's like, do you remember when Hogan came back in 2003 as Mr. America? They pre-taped him showing his mask so if he ever walked out they'll just say, oh look we caught him, he's Hulk Hogan, he's fired. Ah, oh, nice. Very good, very good. Vince being paro about Kerry leaving the company, that's the exact same thing that happened with Lesnar when he signed. Because he was so paranoid that Brock was going to leave and go back to the UFC or something, he just, ah, sure, fuck it, we'll just have seen him beat him on his first match back. Mm -hmm. It's grand. We'll just drop about 10 million in yeah, buys. Yeah, in, in revenue throughout the whole year, yeah. So, hmm. Do 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 do. It's only a game <laughs> show. <laughs> Post-match, Heenan and Perfect complain to Gene. Mean Gene cuts Perfect off and we go back to ringside. Our next match, Sensational Sherry versus Sapphire. And so starts the show-long storyline about what's going on with Sapphire. Do we really need five segments on it? No. Fair enough, you know, if they put it on a Saturday night's main event or something. But, to cho you know, after people have paid money to see this... And you fill up about 30 minutes of your show with this shite. Oh, God. <laughs> so Sensational Sherry is in the ring dressed as a silver cat? I have it written down. She's like a cross between Jushin Liger and the cast of cats. Mm -hmm. mm. Accurate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I wasn't digging her pencil moustache. That she no. What no. was that all about? <laughs> Dusty's team hits. She's supposed to wrestle Sherry, but we have to endure a long no-show spot. And Jesus Christ. Crocodile Dundee tells Fink that brown sauce forfeits if she doesn't show, and she doesn't. You had Crocodile Dundee? Yeah. I had uh, Jim Bowen in a blonde monk's wig. <laughs> <laughs> Got both your things. Or I just have some cretin. <laughs> Uh, so Sherry wins by forfeit by screaming down from 10. Man, we dodged a bullet. Cut to Dusty, who exclaims he hasn't seen brown sauce. She's disappeared into fat air. <laughs> Dusty says Sapphire's been receiving lots of anonymous expensive gifts, including a new Cadillac. And he's happy for her, but sad that she's into materialistic things. Piper contends that Sapphire has to work two jobs to be with Dusty, so she's right to accept them. <laughs> that made me quite sad that they're saying oh the son of a plumber he doesn't make that much and he you know well, you're not getting paid to wrestle he's yeah, a professional wrestler for pretty high say. up on the card <laughs> <laughs> you got about eight segments <laughs> hey Axel, have you seen Sapphire baby no no I haven't Dust but we're all still looking for her 
Because, like, when he first came to WWF, he had these uh, segments to get over Common Man. So he'd be, like, in the back of a garbage truck and he'd be washing someone's car and that kind of stuff. But wasn't he, like, coming in as, like, NWA champion or something? <laughs> garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> the Warlord with Slick versus Mr. Personality, Tito Santana. Now, this match was supposed to be Tito versus Martel and their blow off, but. They went with the Warlord instead and gave the excuse that Martel was off modelling in France. Where was Martel? Oh, he's injured. Yeah. It's a good reason for to not have him there because it explains it and it will also garner heat because he's a model. Oh, perfect. This is a classic example of... A perfect example. A perfect example <laughs> of cards back then. Just pure filler matches left, right and centre. You don't have to have whatever there is, 10 matches or... Perfect in Tornado. Double that length. Rockers and Power and Glory do that length. Yeah. Agree, 100%. Jay, did you like the Warlord's Kano mask? It was the fucking bee's knees, it baby. Was, wasn't he it? has the coolest outfit ever. It's so good. And his staff with the W on it. It's like, <laughs> this is wrestling. This right here. <laughs> Him. <laughs> yeah. Piper says that he won't call Tito a bee eater or a taco vendor. Yeah. You just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> size of Warlord he is huge and he's awesome and he's his jocks are Austin's jocks I, I was I actually had that written down Warlord is just a big roidy stone cold he's the exact same gear I was thinking more Snitsky to be honest you know when Snitsky shaved his head mm. Mm. yeah but a stone cold snit Austin <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't his fault uh, Vince yeah and Vince comments that he's big all over apparently <laughs> but that's quite <laughs> Yeah. His action figure isn't anatomically correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this match just showcases Warlord's strength. So he does powerful kickouts, power slams, big clubbing blows, and Tito hits his finish to flying forearm, but Warlord gets a foot on the rope. Warlord makes quick work of Tito, beating him with a big running power slam a la British Bulldog at 528. So Tito's job to power the pain over the last two pay-per-views, as he lost to Barbarian in WrestleMania 6. I love the Warlord and I think he could have been like fed to Hogan or Warrior at a pay-per-view like many big dudes before him. Why not? Yeah, well, because Earthquake is the big dude on, on the scene now so he just it was at the wrong time for Warlord, I'd say. That's true, yeah. You just build him up and he can do it next year SummerSlam. Yeah. This guy just he looks like a star, doesn't he? He really especially in Vince's head mm. he is the definition of what a superstar wrestler should be. Uh, the match was alright. I was happy to see Tito get squashed, so good <laughs> stuff. Yes, yeah, similar. So we get a quick ad for the Survivor Series. He rams it down our throats with the numbers on a few times. Cut to Sean Mooney as he gets over. There is a new member of Demolition. It's Crush! <laughs> Which is used to cheat in tag matches via creating confusion and twin magic. And plus, they also talk about the um, spirit squad slash free bird rule, you know, where if you've got a tag team with multiple people in it, then any two can defend the belts. That's excellent, yeah. That's I, exactly I, right. I love that gimmick. When Smash doesn't talk during a promo and Axe or Crush is talking, you know the bit in extras when Ricky Gervais is doing the genie, he's doing the panto. And okay. he's doing, oh, I've been in that lamp so long and bent out of all proportion. <laughs> I'm telling you, watch crew, watch smash. He's <laughs> doing that every couple of minutes. He does a lot of funny caricatures, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. looking around and yeah, yeah making yeah. faces and that. <laughs> well, let's splice and let the audience yes, decide. Yes, we will. Blimey, what a big puff. Cheeky. How does somebody as big as you fit into this tiny lamp? Don't worry about it. I'm used to squeeze myself into tight holes. Oh, I've been in that lamp so long, I'm bent out of all recognition. <laughs> mean Gene talking to uh, Brett and Anvil. It was an alright promo. Brett says he thought it was the original team, Axe and Smash, but he flubs and say, oh, it's Axe and Crush. It was Smash and Crush. Uh -huh. There's one for Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> you know, Brett's definitely getting better, 
but he finished on the best slash worst line that you could. And he says, it's like what Phil Collins says, we're two hearts beating as one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was supposed to be about a woman. You know, so <laughs> romantic interest. I just don't care. Settle <laughs> down, Anvil. Settle down. He's a little anxious, and so am I. Anxious to once again be the World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Champions. <laughs> and now, since we only have to worry about two demolition, you can bet that the Hart Foundation, we're gonna make flatliners out of Axe and Crush. Yeah, demolition! After the heart attack we're gonna give you, you'll be buying pacemakers by the truckload, baby! Yeah! <laughs> Just like Phil Collins says, what we have here are two hearts. Beating as one. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get back to ringside. And, and then Vince says to cap it off, oh, uh, two hearts beating a one. I can't imagine the sight of that. It wasn't supposed to be taken literally, <laughs> fucking moron. So in the end, it's two out of three of the Demolition Squad and it's Crush and Smash. The Heart Foundation get their title match after killing the Bolsheviks in a matter of seconds at WrestleMania 6. Orange Crush from the Pacific Northwest Territory was brought in to reduce the workload of Axe and to make them uh, to, and to make Demolition more different than LOD. And Vince knew that if you add in a third one, they'll lose popularity. So let's turn them heel. Mm. And he's right. To start off, there's a weird grip only test of strength where they're like, eh, breath and smash like this. <laughs> it's gay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a lovely classic Brett backbreaker and second rope elbow drop, but Demolition respond with a Demolition decapitation and get the first fall. Crush gets three on Brett, and they also start the second fall. Demolition work over Brett, who eventually gets the hot tag, and a great scoop slam by Anvil, followed up by a slingshot turnbuckle spear and a heart attack. This is great tag team fluency, but Crush stops the ref from counting three, but gets DQ'd, so it's the same outcome. Yeah. Yeah. You could have attacked Brett to break the three, but Brett doesn't sell those. That's actually <laughs> true, yeah. And maybe he knew that, and that's why he went for the referee. <laughs> no, but, yeah, kayfabe. <laughs> Demolition distract the ref, and Axe comes down to ringside and hides under the ring. So Demolition do the old switcheroo, whereby Axe comes down, then Smash leaves the ring and is replaced by Axe, right? You would think that someone would have told Hebner to watch out for this potential switcheroo, right? They actually made it easy for him by starting with the two with long hair, right? So he just had to make a mental note of that. So if I see that guy leaving and there's a guy with short hair in, they must have done the switcheroo. Did he considering think... one's about a foot shorter and about <laughs> six inches wider than the rest of them. But he just had to look at their hair. And did he think Smash got a haircut under the ring? <laughs> Knowing full well the beaver wasn't at the paper here. <laughs> um, also, Demolition have different face paint. Yes, so. they do indeed. There's nothing twinny about them. So, Crush has black face paint and Axe has half red. So, so if you factor in the different heights, the different face paint, the different haircuts and the different weights, <laughs> you still couldn't cop this. Genius. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, when I was seven, I couldn't tell them apart. But Back Earl Hebner isn't seven. <laughs> <laughs> he also knows these men. <laughs> <laughs> Although, this gimmick would work if they wrestled in their awesome masks. Yes. Because I, I, yes. I think those, those masks are so fucking cool looking. Yeah. Hitman hits a sunset flip on Smash. Oh man, I miss... Arn's Aloha Don't you mean that you miss Aaron's greatest selling ever? No. Yes. <laughs> I do miss it. I really yeah, do so miss do it. So do I. Yeah. Um, there is a cool double team pendulum slam by Anvil using Brett, but it only garners a two. In the confusion, Axe switcheroos with Smash, and twin magic is complete. At Atch. <laughs> Axe switches back with Smash and the heels were set to get the win but the Legion do come down to ringside to even the odds, interfering and in the confusion Anvil hits a super jock and nerd spot and Brett pins Crush and wins the Tag Team Championship for the second time in 1547. 
Yeah, so the Road Warriors, they debuted on the 15th July Wrestling Challenge and they were mega over veteran heel tag championships the world over. Many, you know, greatest tag they team awards. They got a monster pop when they came out at the end of the match. So these were, yeah, massive tag team before arriving in WWF. Yet this pay-per-view was a very hard sell on the dream match of Demolition versus LOD. And yeah, I want to see it. Yeah, I do. Big time. Yeah, absolutely. I thought this match was very good. I thought it was probably it was probably the best Demolition match that I've seen them in. Uh, Bret Hart is an absolute fucking hero. He's so good. And Crush is the absolute opposite to him. He's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I go along with Steve I thought it was really good match and it just goes to show how good a tag team division can be Crush is like the worst mullet <laughs> in the Fed so far although early 90s are yet to come a Wrestlemania 7 ad Vince is still under the impression that it will be at the LA Memorial Coliseum with over 100,000 fans some cool clips of wrestlers on the move million dollar man driving Bushwhackers in a water slide and Dusty in the back of a garbage truck. We're, move, we're going to WrestleMania. Mean Gene interviews the Legion of Doom, Hawk and Animal, who get over they want a feud with Demolition. The new tag champions, Brett and Anvil, arrive. Interestingly, when Mean Gene brings up, oh, break out the champagne, Hawk says, we have no woes like Demolition they can drink. And it's like, did you just let slip that you drink when you're sad? Jeez, oh, I didn't yeah, pick that yeah. God, I didn't pick that up at okay. all. Hawk awkwardly overreaches to stroke Anvil's beard. He's like, eh, <laughs> <laughs> get your own beard. <laughs> didn't uh, Warrior do that to Anvil like uh, one or two shows ago with, with the. Uh, yeah. Awesome. But, but he was in front of him, so it was easy reach. Yeah. His was like a. What do you call it when the gays do it back to back? Uh, oh, um. It's like skiing or something, is it? No, that's not skiing. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm not doing it. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a rudder. rudder yeah, yeah. Oh, the Dutch rudder. There you go. Dutch the Dutch rudder. <laughs> nice. So he was given <laughs> a <of> Dutch rudder. <laughs> It was Vince's idea to call them Legion of Doom, much like not Carry Von Eric, it's primarily the Texas Tornado, it's Legion of Doom, not the Road Warriors. Yeah, but people remember the Legion of Doom a lot more than they'd remember the name Road Warriors. Well, the WWF won out on the wars, so whatever they did is the one people remember. Yeah. It's a cool name, though. Yeah, it's awesome. And... Go, go on. on. No. Who else go is called on. Legion of Doom? Banded together from remote galaxies are 13 of the most sinister villains of all time, the Legion of Doom. Dedicated to a single objective, the conquest of the universe. Only one group dares to challenge this intergalactic threat, the Super Friends. The Justice League of America versus the Legion of Doom. This is... The Challenge of the Super Friends! From outside Demolition's locker room, Sean Mooney gets over how they're mad at LOD, not Brett and Anvil. <laughs> mean Jean chats to Sherry. She enjoys her forfeit victory and how Sapphire's missing. Uh, so Jean says to Sherry that there have been earlier sightings of brown sauce, right? <laughs> And then I was literally had the pen in my hand and was just about to write it down. And then Sherry says it. Earlier sightings? What is she? A UFO? I can't believe Sherry and me had the same quips. (laughs) 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 These are the stories from my life. (laughs) Sean Mooney talks to Hacksaw and newly faced Nikolai Volkov. Uh, he mentions the Persian Gulf and that the Cold War is over. And they love America and have a new enemy, the Japs. <laughs> <laughs> Volkov turned face by accepting a flag from Jim Duggan and is now a US sympathiser. Steve, you've been a heel for far too long. Please accept this American flag. <laughs> <laughs> and become a good guy by turning your back on your country and supporting mine. 
<laughs> it, it is utterly ridiculous. It is insane. Oh, oh, did anything happen? As in, did his mate beat him up or something? Did Russia disown him? Now, the Cold War is over. This gimmick's dead. Fucking split him. Russia loves face. America now. Yeah. Okay, well, he can be Russian and not have an American flag, but he can just say, I'm very happy with America. <laughs> I'm content in America, but I got my Russian flag. Since you're waving a flag, you are now American and can enjoy all the freedom that entails. This fucking foreigner turned American gimmick, it's been used throughout time, always unsuccessfully. Like, Takamichi in 98. It's like, I'm with the headbangers now, oh fuck. And like, Jimmy Wang Yang, he's now a wife beater. Oh god, yeah. yeah. That was poor. In the sixth pre-tape of the night, Earthquake recounts injuring Hogan and his new best mate, Tugboat. Bravo mentions Boss Boob, and Jimmy says they're gonna need two stretchers tonight for Hogan and Boss Man. And we'll get back to them closer to their match. I thought this was a really good promo. I think Earthquake is a tremendous promo. Much, much better than, like, Memory had him. Yeah, he's really good. He doesn't need Bravo and Jimmy Hart. No. He can do this on his own. He can cut a great promo and he's fucking menacing and I hope, well I know, but I hope that they do something really great with him. But I don't think that's going to happen, but I hope and I know. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying. Sean Mooney talks to Jake Roberts where Bad News Brown has found his answer to Damien and that's literally sewer rats. Rats from Harlem sewer. <laughs> they pulled... The camera goes into his dressing room where he stores the sewer rats, obviously. And then they pull off the cover and it's just one rat and he looks dead. <laughs> <laughs> where is this? I was expect. I was like, this is going to look fucking disgusting. Like a fucking Pied Piper coming exactly. out with a big swarm exactly. of rats behind them. <laughs> There's nice. one fucking rat. This is the doldrums of wrestling. This bullshit. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> I have to say, I love this promo by Jake. Size of Damien, holy shit, man. He says that hunger separates a man like him from a mouse like you. The snake is all over (laughs) Jake's face and wraps around him. And it looks awesome, but he keeps, like, batting it away. Yeah, and it really took away from the promo because all I kept seeing was the little tail gun. Mm. Yeah. So I wasn't uh, wasn't into it, like, unfortunately. They should have just fucking retucked the thing. Jake Ro- yes. So our next match is Jake Roberts versus Bad News Brown with the big boss man as a special guest referee to keep law and order and to not brawl to the back. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like boss man's little cap? I loved it. I thought it was great. Piper calls him Buzzer Man, which would have been funny a couple of pay-per-views ago, but this guy is looking in really good shape now. Yeah. Yeah. There's a box at ringside apparently containing 200 pounds of hungry sewer rats. But we never get to see them. But if you actually went to Wrestling Challenge, he did cut one promo where he had a big, massive fake rat and he dropped it in to a big box and someone's like... (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) There's so many reactions. Just just don't come any closer. What was his intention? What was he going to do with the rats? See, you know, he's scared of a snake, so he's going to get these rats and he's not feeding them so they're hungry and they're going to eat Damien. They're going to eat Damien. What if they ate Bad News Brown? <laughs> Hadn't thought of that. <laughs> they don't like dark meat. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys mind Bossman being a referee but not wearing a referee's shirt? So there's nothing to denote referee. But he is denoting. He is the law in this ring. And I have a point about that. Go on. I believe he's involved in two matches to uphold the law. But why doesn't he ref every fucking match? Why is certain <laughs> matches, yeah, have to uphold law and order here and others... Not going to bother. Maybe he just looked at the booking sheet and said, <laughs> I'll do two. So if he's <laughs> walking the Give me the, the two beat, highest paid ones. He's walking the beat. I will stop two crimes and they'll let the rest go. Maybe he was afraid that if Bad News Brown got his way, he would unleash a plague of rats on Philadelphia. So it's, he's basically preventing global terrorism. Yes. <laughs> He is preventing the second coming of the bubonic plague. Yes. So this is a public By law. (laughs) (laughs) By hitting someone with a stick. Yes. (laughs) 
Anyway, fuck this match. Plodding punch kick affair, and we also get our brawl to the outside shortcuts. Until Buzzle Man DQs Bad News Brown for using a padded chair a second time. Post match, Buzzle Man pulls Damien away as Bad News Brown tries to leg drop it. Brown Pearl harbors the boss man, and Jake returns in kind with Damien. And Bad News Brown scarpers, leaving his box o rats at ringside. <laughs> um, I don't. I didn't like this much. Oh, terrible. I've got some fantastic news for you. Go on. This is Bad News Brown's final pay-per-view match. Yes. <laughs> that is good news. That make that makes up for all the losses we've had. That really does. He's fucking awesome. he's been around for a long fucking time, this guy. So uh, what was the DQ for in this match? I For I, all time's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Mean Gene interviewing Demolition. They moan and call the Hearts cheaters. They don't want to get the belts back yet. They want to batter the Legion of Doom first. I sense Survivor Series match coming up. Mm. Piss break time, as it's the brother love show. A little uh, breaky boo. Yeah, no problem, mate. It's time for the ad break questionarium. What the Jim Duggan, Bad News Brown, <laughs> and Roddy Piper have in common. Peter Rugged is tough work, but now and then I take a break with my favorite WWF, Superstars of Wrestling Ice Cream Bar. Oh. That Joe's surrounded by Cobras. Yeah, but that Joe's Sergeant Slaughter. He's joined the G.I. Joe team. So we're celebrating by giving away Sergeant Slaughter action figures, but you can't buy them in stores. You've got to earn them. Here's how. Collect five Sergeant Slaughter certificates or call the number on the certificate and Sergeant Slaughter will tell you how to get in on the action with only four certificates. There's a $1 handling charge. See details in specially marked packages. G.I. Joe! Nobody takes on Cobras better than Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah, Joe! So the outbreak questionarium was, what do Bad News Brown, Jim Duggan, and Roddy Piper have in common? The answer is... They're all cunts. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> Piss break time. <laughs> As it's the brother love show. He calls the fans weak and soft and introduces Drill Sergeant Slaughter, who was kicked out of the army. So he's newly healed as Iraq's invasion of Kuwait happened three weeks prior. Yeah, so, I mean, he came, obviously, de- debuted after WrestleMania, then the war kicked off soon after, so he was around just at the right time, with the right game. It was perfect timing, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. He says the same as love, and that only one man is brave enough to have the Sergeant Slaughter Great American Award, Brother Love. Boo. What an awesome, massive medal. And he salutes, and that's awesome. How can you say Brother Love is the most American? Like, there is no shortage of wrestlers whose gimmick is they love America. <laughs> yeah. Even the Russian fella <laughs> loves America. You know what I mean? Sergeant Slaughter's uh, theme tune was just a drum roll. Which uh, is great. And I, I, I was just like, my God, this segment is such a joke. Where are my hi-hats? Like... <laughs> <laughs> He was in the middle of the AWA's Team Challenge series, where it's they just have massive groups of tag teams, and they have a big point system, and the winner gets a check. Sounds like this awful TNA-style Russo booking. <laughs> it was a dying last-ditch throw from Greg Gagne, actually. There was three teams, Team Zabisco, Team Slaughter, and Team Baron. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Slaughter left, so Colonel De Beers had to take over. Boo. It was a pile of shite. It, it sounded insane. <laughs> so Slaughter declares war on the pinko, commie, maggot, scum, puke, the turncoat Volkov, and that Saddam Hussein would <laughs> kick America's ass. <laughs> he actually can cut a promo. I mean, it's the generic boo America, yay foreign country promo, but he puts it together, okay? I suppose this is the first American to turn his back on America, so that's unique. I was shocked at how mild the booze were for him when he says, Iraq would kill us in a war. I, I expected, like, because if you said that shit now, riots. Yeah. 
Yeah, people were really dying in this war. You know, hundreds of coalition soldiers, tens of thousands of Iraqis, and these assholes are shamelessly exploiting that for cheap heat? Fuck off. Yeah, fuck, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why WrestleMania 7 doesn't have 100,000 fans. Take 85,000 away and you might get the accurate number. Ah, oh, threats! Your bomb threats! That's why we couldn't sell the tickets. <laughs> Full of shit. <laughs> Fuck off, <laughs> man. Fuck you. <laughs> Sean Mooney is with the Orient Express and Mr. Fuji. This is an awesome racist promo. This is amazing. So superpower, the USA and the USSR come together again. Honorable Japanese know-how. This doing? one from USA, Hacksaw Duggan. He have one cross eye. We hit him so hard. After match, he have Two cross eye. This one from USSR Volkov. <laughs> we kick him in head so hard. We leave him big red block right there. Like Gorbachev. <laughs> well, gentlemen, sure you must realize. Wait a minute. <laughs> Orient Express, I'm terribly oh. sorry. We have some late breaking news. Let's take you now to Mean Gene. Amazing. <laughs> is it just me or is Sean Mooney always angry? He's always got a scale on his face. He's always annoyed that he has to be interviewing the people he's interviewing. He's always cutting them off and rushing to the next interview. I get the impression that he's kind of viewed as the joke and he's given all the shit promos and he's probably rushed and things like that. So he's like bitter and angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I see he it. He looks anyway. at the call sheet and who are you interviewing? Oh, the Bushwhackers. Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> the Bushwhackers again. <laughs> Luke. <laughs> So Moody interrupts the throw to Mean Gene, who sees Sapphire going into her locker room and slamming the door. So it's the Orient Express, Sato and Tanaka with Mr. Fuji versus the superpowers, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Nikolai Volkov, who come out to Luger's pro-America theme, Hail to the Chief. Piper heals out a bit, asking what the Patriots combined IQ is, and Vince replies, oh it doesn't matter, if you're American presumably. Patriots Duggan and Volkov pander to the audience by singing God Bless America for Kate Smith. Who? 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 Yeah, who is this woman? Kate Smith is a famous American singer from the 40s. Oh, she's also a bowler. <laughs> <laughs> you have to post that picture. <laughs> Uh, she's from TNA country, Virginia. <laughs> Children all over the world crying when it posted up. <laughs> um... Yeah, they're out of tune and it's awful. More propaganda BS from Hacksaw. Uh, we get a missed time, a double atomic drop, and that kind of sucked. The faces continually cut off the heels. That, that's a bit weird. The match seems to be in fast forward with turning the tide so often. And yeah, that's right. Duggan just does the three point stance and hits a running clothesline for the three. It, like, it, it just felt it was in the closing segments of the match. You know, it's, Right from the get go, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, this match was pretty meh, but um, I actually thought Duggan looked decent. A little bit more sprightly than normal. A little <laughs> bit more animated. But... A little bit more American. America. Yet again, got a, a pinfall. That's a real shocker. I'm sure he lobbied for the DQ win. <laughs> <laughs> Outside Brown Sugar's locker room, Gene interviews Dusty, who says he needs her, but he has to go to his match as it's next. Sean Mooney quickly talks to Macho Man from his throne, who says he's not surprised Sapphire doesn't want to be associated with a common man. And that match is next. It's the American Dream Dusty Rhodes versus the Macho King Randy Savage. Did you see Macho's polystyrene throne? It had all bits flaked off it and all. It looked oh, fucking awesome. Really? No, not awesome. The opposite oh, of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sean Mooney yet again angry. Because he's on a rickety little stepladder thing. It's very good. <laughs> Before the match can kick off, DiBiase interrupts from the interview podium and reveals that he has bought Sapphire and brings her out with a fur coat and necklace and a WWF branded sports bag full of cold, hard cash. Why was DiBiase bribing brown sauce? Uh, to fuck with Dusty. He's doing it to prove a point that everyone's got a price. That's okay, because I thought he was attracted to Brent Sauce. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's just, I was, yeah, I was a bit confused. Dusty goes to confront the Million Dollar Man and Brent Sauce, but thankfully Macho stops him and brings him fucking back to the ring. 
They continued to smoz, with Sherry interfering and my worst fears were founded as this was just a fucking angle, not a match. Macho blindsides Dusty with the loaded purse and pins Dusty at 214. Did you notice that Sherry hands him something, he loads the purse, ref's back is turned he hits him with the purse. He could either have done two things. One, he could have taken the item <laughs> off Sherry and whacked Dusty with it. Yeah. Leave the purse at ringside. Or put the foreign object in the purse and bring it to the ring and whack him with the purse. Don't have two foreign objects. Combine them and then hit him. <laughs> Sparkling logic, Steve. <sighs> this was shit, man. Both yeah. men deserve better than this, don't they? This whole feud has been like this. It's been non-match, really bad fucking brother love segments, and then a really terrible intergender match. Just let them have a one-on-one, ten-minute singles wrestling match. Guess what? <laughs> no. It's the fucking blow off. Oh. That's it. We're done. Well, oh. well, on the plus side, Macho went over. That's true. Post match, DiBiase, Virgil, and Sapphire leave via limousine. And uh, it's kind of funny to see Dusty kind of slap the back of the limo. Does watching this, does this not make you feel a lot better about watching today's product? Because we get clean finishes these days. Yeah. We at least get. Great matches, much better than the quality match we got back here. The only difference is like the character strength and roster depth of today is nowhere near as good as was yesteryear. You See, know. if you don't have great characters and great promos, you can't get as emotionally invested into the wrestlers. So. <laughs> <laughs> what a character! I'm not splicing it. <laughs> Please. <laughs> So it's time for the first match of our co-main event. It's Canadian Earthquake with Jimmy Hart and Dino Bravo versus the immortal Hulk Hogan and the big boss man. Dino Bravo at ringside who runs laps inside the ring. This scaldy fuck better have a manager's license. (laughs) (laughs) So just before the match, the faces cut a promo getting over Philadelphia's and how it's a birth place of many rights. Hogan, re- he did. it was very cheesy, but he did get me in the end with Thomas Jefferson Bossman and George Washington Hogan. <laughs> Here we go, Hulkster. You know something, Earthquake? I remember what it felt like to be underneath your massive frame as you came crashing down on my ribcage. And I also remember you, Dino Bravo, and Jimmy Hart laughing out loud as they rolled me out in that stretcher, man. I remember the tears in the eyes of all my little Hulksters, wondering if this was really the end of Hulkamania. The question that even I wondered about myself. But most of all, I remember the outpouring of all my Hulkamaniacs, all their cards, man, all their letters, and thank God for all their prayers. And I also remember the man who was leading the charge of all my Hulkamaniacs, the big bad tugboat. You know something, Earthquake? The memory is still fresh in my mind of you and Dino Bravo double-teaming the tugboat, making sure he wouldn't be in my corner here at SummerSlam. And that's why we're dedicating this match tonight to the Tugster. And it's also why your plan's not going to work, Earthquake, because I'm not going into the ring on my own tonight. I've got the big boss man on my side, making sure that justice will be served. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Earthquake. <laughs> Dino Bravo, Jimmy Hart, this is Philadelphia, where many other rats on the people were first formulated. But the only rats you three are entitled to are the right to be beaten into silence. The right to have millions of fans present during that beating. And the right to a swift and impartial trial with Justice Judge Hogan presiding. Ah, big boss man, I can tell you your founding fathers would be mighty proud. You know something that's right, me, Gene. Another chapter in American history will be written tonight. And just as Thomas Bossman Jefferson stood at the side of George Washington Hogan as I chopped down the cherry tree with the 24-inch pythons, we'll chop you down, Earthquake, and the holster never tells a lie. So what you gonna do when the holster and the big boss man pass their constitutional rights on to you. I can hardly wait for this one, Vince. Let's get back to you. Wow. Hogan and Bossman get separate entrances. How do you like that? Piper continually calls Earthquake a warthog. 
So, just a bit of background. And the 26th May Superstars, Hogan was a guest on the Brother Love Show, and Earthquake came out and squashed Hogan a few times and put him on the shelf with a broken sternum. It worked a treat as Earthquake looked like a fucking killer taking out Hogan, while in reality, Hogan was off filming Suburban Commando. And getting into awesome shape. He was absolutely ripped for this match. Hogan's big return was at July 14th Superstars, where he returned with the biggest Hulkamark tugboat. Hogan had been voicing, oh, I should retire, brother. And tugboat came out and was like, oh, fans, ride in and get Hogan to change his mind. And little did they know, everyone that rode in got, like, WWF's merch catalogue for the next 10 years. <laughs> nice! That's really clever. <laughs> Earthquake laid Tugboat out as well. Vince changed his mind on him and put the boss man in on the pay-per-view. So Hogan had to dig deep into his merry band of jobbers, and he came up with the big boss man. Yeah, per beefer. I mean, Hogan's now made two new mates, Tugboat mm. and boss man. That's a fucking sneak off. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian Earthquake and Jimmy Hart and Dino Bravo are already in the ring and then Bossman and Hulk Hogan come out and Hogan slides into the ring. <laughs> what is it, Steve? <laughs> it's a tremendous story is what it is, Jay. Uh, the Seven Shane were talking about school there like last week. Shane went to like an all Irish mixed sex school and I went to like horrible stupid Christian boys school. Hated it. His mate Dave in his class was like just absolute nut job mentaler and he said that he went there one night and it was his aim to shag the most minging horrible looking bird and then brag about it the next day with the lads, you know. I, I've no idea what her name was. Uh, I don't even know the girl. But supposedly she's like a big butch thing, the captain of the like camogie team and things like that. And uh, like Dave finally got her back to his gaff and he was just about to like bang her. And then she started like screaming and I'm like, slide her in, slide her in. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fucking horrific. <laughs> is that an accurate voice representation? <laughs> that is the voice that both of them do. <laughs> And that's, and that's all I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> it was a main event anecdote, <laughs> <sighs> They kick off with a collar and elbow tie-up, and Earthquake no-sells Hogan's punches, but Hogan sells his. They get over that Earthquake is more powerful than Hogan, but Hogan finally knocks Earthquake on his arse with a haymaker. Oddly, this match descends into a schmoz as both corner men get into the ring and attack their partner's opponents. But no no, no DQ. Yeah. Well, it was commented on that he's not going to stop the match because it's exciting or something like that. Okay, well, at least they, they, they actually made yeah. comment on it. Piper actually was banging on about Hulk Hogan looking like leaner and a lot slimmed down. And he was basically saying that since he could never overpower someone the size of Quake, that it was in his best interest to lose weight and train for cardio, so that the longer it went, it was in his favour. Yeah, I tremendous. thought that was absolutely tremendous commentary yeah. from uh, Piper. Yeah. Something I thought I'd never see, Earthquake gives Hogan a top rope club to the back. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Brett's never done that. <laughs> no, he hasn't. That's pretty damn impressive. They must have uh, reinforced the rings. <laughs> Earthquake slaps on a 2012 Walls of Jericho, I a Boston crab, and Hogan gets to the ropes. There is an endless bear hug on Hogan, and he tries to escape by tearing Earl's t-shirt. Yeah, what was going on yeah. there? Hogan escapes, but gets a slam for his troubles. So Earthquake does the two-year-old tantrum and hits the whoopsie! And then Vince, oh fuck you man, but he starts reading Hogan's obituary and career retrospective. <laughs> <laughs> Earth definitely gonna lose uh, as Earthquake hits it again but Hogan kicks out a two who would have thought it it wasn't even two it was barely two mm. fuck's sake fuck you Hulk Hogan Hogan put over huge by no selling what is essentially a big injury angle like this is like if someone no sold two of Orton's punts to the head and still came back and won the match yep yeah, who, yeah, who did yeah. that help? And this is a move that could have, you know, it's it's already oh he broke Hogan's stern. This move was already over. Yeah, yeah. and now they've just yeah. 
They've undone mm. it all, yeah. yeah. He's used to it now. He's absorbed the... Or he's, he's immune to whoopsies now. <laughs> <laughs> and Hogan hulks up. They schmoz to the outside and the ref starts counting and I was like, oh, fuck's sake. But Hogan actually finally slams Earthquake to a little pop because he was trying it the whole night. On a table that doesn't break, so he just kind of slides yeah, it slides on. <laughs> <laughs> and Hogan makes it back in before the ten. And Earl calls for the counted win as Hogan literally jumps for joy. <laughs> He's like, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> he looked like such a Nancy. Quake goes back in to, to get his heat back on Hogan, start beating him up. And he doesn't even get that luxury because Bossman comes in, breaks it up, and now... Where does Quake go from here? I have to say that there was a cool spot where Earthquake absorbs three chair shots before releasing his choke on Hogan. So, you know, that's that's a bit of a push. Boss man wallops him with the chair. It was up there with the nastiest chair shots I've ever seen. It was like, remember when uh, at Mania when Hunter was smacking Taker with the chairs and you see the welts on his back? I think this was even worse. And then Hogan celebrates for the next two hours. Hmm. Even though Hogan won this, it was by a smarmy DQ, so they're trying their best to keep both strongs, but keep Hogan happy. Hogan actually changed the script of the finish to go for this, because it was like, oh, we'll just do a bigger payoff somewhere down the line. No. <laughs> no, never, never came. <laughs> what I would have liked would be if... So Quake, who are they putting over as an unstoppable monster, and they're doing a great job up until this point... Have him beat Hogan a few times. I'm thinking maybe two times, right? Then he goes after Warrior, beats him for the title, and then you've got the two biggest baby faces in the company going after this unstoppable monster heel. You can have all sorts of matches going on there. I think it would have kept the interest going for quite some time. And then Garvin could come back and do it. <laughs> <laughs> and be a special guest ring announcer. Yes. <laughs> and be like, state of your onesie earthquake. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, Steve. Definitely. That yeah, was that's actually really good booking. I thought this match was pretty good. To me, this this felt like the main event. And yes. I think I think everyone thought it was the main event. Yeah, as well. yeah. it really did. But I I really enjoyed the match. Really impressed with Earthquake. Like I, like I didn't have the fondest memories of him. You know, I thought you know just big guy, and I'm sure he's a slob. But man, he's he's pulling his weight, mm. and his promos are great as yeah. well. Because I personally had much fonder of memories of tugboat and typhoon and things like that you know because that came a couple of years later but watching his earlier stuff he was fucking great yeah. good promo monster heel good stuff sean mooney is backstage with bobby heenan and the number one contender rick rude rude alludes to rocky the film franchise <laughs> but that was hollywood and this the wwf is reality <laughs> and Heenan gets over the seriousness of the steel cage uh, so you see Rude here he's cut his hair short although he's also kept the ravishing part this is the most serious we've ever seen him so this is him trying to gun for you know main event heel mode um, mm-hmm. how did he become number one contender or was it ever official who else would face Warrior who else on the roster because yeah. Earthquake's gone to Hogan and to Hogan mate that was the right choice for Hogan Big you know? who else is more established than Rude it really felt like a filler feud. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly it. This match has no heat. They already fucking did one last year, so who cares? You know that Rude isn't going to win. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. Rick Rude, he had a lot of training vignettes and regularly touted the fact that he's the only one to have beaten the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 5. They already faced off at Saturday night's main event on the 28th of July, but it ended in a DQ thanks to Heenan, and so that's why this cage match was made, to keep Heenan out. Good fucking job. <laughs> Even this, that's a worthless stiff, and this is <laughs> 22 years ago, and you shit on your own stiff. Gene's backstage with Dusty, who's sad, but he'll say he'll take shelter in America. And he's not turning who. Fuck off. <laughs> Cut to Alfred Hayes at ringside as we see the construction of the blue cage. He says the crew's record is 8 minutes 42 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us that. <laughs> Holy shit. I hope you started before the rude interview. <laughs> this um, would be a good time to take a five minute break. Yeah. Right? And he discusses that it's it's the streamlined crew erecting the cage. You know, why would that make it faster? It'd make it slower, wouldn't it? Okay, we've, we've laid off three of the lads, but we're going to break our record today. 
Alfred Hayes says he's got 12 experienced erectors. <laughs> I do believe they're called fluffers in the business. <laughs> What better way to kill time during a stage or a cage erection <laughs> than to discuss the cage erection? It's it's like a watch pot never boils, you know? <laughs> Stand here staring at the cage. Genius. <laughs> you know the way like Meltzer and shit is always banging on about the whole point of a cage to keep people from interfering in the match. And blah, blah, blah. And so I, I, I never personally viewed it like that. And uh, Lord Al was saying that the point of the cage in this case is to keep both men from running away from each other so that they have to fight. And I'd view it more like that. Come on. So you have to batter him so much, only then can you escape. That's like, there's always going to be at least one face in a cage match. And he's never going to run away. Well, he's never going to run away. It's, okay, then, let's keep the heel from running but away. But the heel wants the WWF Championship. He's not going to run away either. He and, wants and, the belt, and, and he's already beaten the champion. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Nonsense. Nonsense. It makes no sense. Nonsense. Backstage Hogan's with Mean Gene in a post-match interview. He says they're erecting earthquake-proof buildings and he's going to batter earthquake all over the US until he gets a title shot. And chase sharks. He was clearly back on the coke in this moment. <laughs> so Hogan, yeah, he mentions earthquake and he's going to beat him all around the country, which I thought was a real good way of promoting their feud. But then he just kind of, brushes, I'm just going to beat earthquake, move on to the title again. This is a great fucking feud you have here. Talk about the feud. After the feud's over, talk about the world title. I thought that was a little injustice to Earthquake. Big time. Vince and Roddy kill some time, and then we go backstage to Earthquake in the heels. Earthquake, you just heard the comments of Hulk Hogan. He spoke of the future of Hulkamania. He certainly proved tonight it is alive and well. Hogan! I'm not finished with you yet! The war has just begun! And it's not only you, Hogan! Boss man! I'm coming for you too! What you did to me! What you did behind my back! It deserves revenge! And I'm gonna get it on both of you! Hogan! I'm not running away from you! Anytime! Anywhere! The quake will be there! Earthquake! You imposed two earthquakes on Hulk Hogan, yet it didn't stop him! It wasn't enough tonight! I don't know what Hogan's been doing! But it's obviously work tonight. But next time, I'll inflict more damage before I give him the earthquake. And next time, you won't be walking out, Hogan. Get your earthquake insurance, Hogan. You better get it. Nothing's going to stop the earthquake. Jimmy heard a lot of predictions tonight. It didn't pan out, even with Dino Bravo at ringside. to me. Boss man was out there with a stick and a steel chair, and they still could stop the earthquake. Nobody's going to stop the earthquake. Hogan, you're going to play. It's only the beginning. Hogan. Clearly, clearly it is not over yet between the earthquake and Hulk Hogan. Let's go back to ringside. He shows off some nasty welts on his back. Which are so nasty, I, I kind of hope they were painted on and not realsies. Mm. Earthquake can't explain how Hogan no-sold his finisher twice. It's as if someone changed the booking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you like Earthquake's Brock Lesnar hop when he's cutting his promo? I yeah. love it. I think it's awesome. I and I love really it that he cool. could still, he's not gas enough and he can still do it post-match. Mm. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. And without missing a beat, his promo is perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One last promo... The 37th of the night with the WWF champion, the ultimate warrior, and he makes a Liberty Bell pun. I'm proud to be standing in the presence of the World Wrestling Federation champion, the ultimate warrior. Uh, do you know what Rick Rude and Bobby Heenan have in common with the Liberty Bell? Well, well, no. Uh, one is cracked, and the other is a ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I really liked it because he's never made a joke before. There's clearly a reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> what a bell end. <laughs> Uh, he also makes Philadelphia references and says the ultimate nation revels in a new frontier. And I thought it was 
pretty cool but corny promo. Mm, I thought no? the promo sucked. <laughs> All right, it's time for our main event. Hit my music. It's Ravishing Rick Rude with Bobby Heenan versus the WWF Champion, the Ultimate Warrior. Really cool looking at Rude. The back of his jocks is him punching the warrior in the face. <laughs> warrior enters and climbs the cage and almost brings it down by pushing and pulling at it. That's exactly what I've written here. <laughs> like four seconds to break what took eight and a half minutes. <laughs> He does enter via scaling the cage and surprisingly connects with a top rope double axe handle. Piper interestingly proposes rude tie warrior's arm tassels to the cage and just casually walk out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fair point. The two automatically go into the what I felt was like a finishing 10 minutes as rude gets a bit of colour and both deliver big moves and get gassed and sell for ages. Rude hits the rude awakening neckbreaker and Vince Automatically jumps to, Ah, oh, Rude's the new WWF champion. Oh, he's a champ. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> you just gave me the finish right there. <laughs> Idiot heel Rude goes to the top of the cage and delivers a one-armed axe handle. I thought Rude getting up and bouncing himself on the top of the cage was fucking cool. He tries it again, but Warrior counters. But Heenan swings the door into Warrior's head. Heenan tries to pull Rude out. How is that legal? It's no less legal than the Royal Rumble spot where you get knocked out and pull someone. I'd say it's yeah a lot more legal than that because there's no DQs in a cage match. Anything goes, yeah. yeah. I suppose you just <coughs> shit on your step there where, you know, Heenan specifically can't interfere and he's pulling out his mate, yeah. the fluffer. <laughs> <laughs> the warrior grabs Rude's tights and exposes Rude's buttocks and beats up Heenan before hulking up. So we get a flurry of clotheslines and Warrior hits the Gorilla Press Slam. He has no problem scaling the cage and mocks Rude with his swivel hips (laughs) before dropping to the outside and winning the match. A bit bit of a flat finish, I thought. So we get a very disappointingly short final gear cage match and Warrior celebrates to see us out. Why do they always have to climb down, you know? The drop isn't that big. Just hang off the cage and fucking drop. How often does somebody get to the top of a cage and then they're pulled back in? If you really want the title that bad, throw yourself off the fucking thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I found it very odd that the heel would do top of the cage spots and the face doesn't. And it's the same with Earthquake. He went off the top rope and Hogan didn't. Yeah. Yeah. What's the deal with the heels being uber stupid? (laughs) Like... Heenan's shouting, fucking just get out! Yeah, yeah. Just come on out! You can come back in and do the move again. <laughs> After you win the match. Is this going to be a sad one? Oh, fuck. Who's gone now? Rude. This is the final pay-per-view for Rick Rude. He left the WWF in October, so before the Survivor Series, and would join WCW a year later. He'd retire due to back injuries in 96, but he'd make sporadic appearances in the WWF, WCW, and ECW. uh, He also famously appeared on Raw and Nitro on the same night, on November 17th in that year. (laughs) (laughs) As Raw was taped a week prior, so that Mm. was pretty awesome. And Rude, of course, died in April 99 at the age of 40. Heart failure. Jesus, 40. Mm. What did you think of this match, anyway? I actually thought it was really good. Bearing in mind Warrior's limitations, I think, well, the cage is one big shortcut anyway, and you should be able to have a good match in the cage. So it was really exciting, and as you said, it was almost, it felt like they were going to the finish straight away, which made it really exciting, fast-paced. Yeah, I was happy enough with it. I mean, following the big match, Earthquake and Hogan, I thought they did a pretty good job. I'm not so positive. I thought the match was all right, nothing special. Uh, I think my biggest problem with it was that I just find it hard to kind of perk myself up for a, a match after something that I view as the main event. Not that hot on the Warrior Reign as champion so far. I think the main problem with this feud is, as you mentioned earlier, no one thought Rude was going to win. And he's a mid carder trying to pull up. And that's not what you need when you're trying to cement a new WWF champion, a new biggest face in the company. And uh, 10 minutes, come on, a cage match main event should be 20 minutes. And they did a fantastic job at last year's SummerSlam. Their mm. match was like 25 mm. minutes, mm. and it was great. I was like Rude's greatest moment in the Fed. 
just dragging Warrior to that match, you know? That and uh, the pose down with Bobby Heenan spraying in the face. <laughs> 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 Alright, let's head straight to the aftermath. Overall, I thought this was better than WrestleMania 6, although WrestleMania 6 had that main event and the two co-main events couldn't live up to that. But overall, thumbs up, although massive thumbs down for the Brother Love segment. That was just painful to sit through. Yeah, I'd say I, I really enjoyed it. Um, the tag matches were really good fun and Hogan and Quake was I thought was excellent. And I enjoyed the main event, so overall I thought it was... One of the better shows I think we've watched. It was cool to see lots of new additions to the roster as well. So we got Tornado, got LOD. I suppose you got Main Event Earthquake now. You got Tugboat. It's like, man, this is, this is cool. You know, because we have had a lot of losses over the last couple of pay-per-views. And it's nice to get some new good ones. Mm. Oh, we've had some devastating losses. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Um, I have to say this paper, you extremely heavy emphasis on getting characters over instead of wrestling. It's like even for the eighties, I felt there was too many promos, too many segments, not enough wrestling. So they it's had the nineties, bro. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, with lots of angles rather than matches, like Michaels was injured, so that was a short match. Perfect and Tornado got five minutes. Snake versus the Sewer Rats, which is nothing. <laughs> Macho and Dusty was another angle. We should have got a proper match, we didn't. Lots of unfinished business, and it's like, let's set up the house show with using our pay-per-views. Yeah. It's like, fuck's sake. The WF tag teams at the moment are absolutely just gleaming. There the two tag matches on this pay-per-view were the best matches of the night. So the Rockers fucking great. Uh, the Hearts, Legion of Doom. You know, it's just things are looking really good at the moment in the tag team division. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, Power and Glory, they're like a job team. They look great yeah. as well. I'm very happy to have yeah. them on board. I have to mention that this pay-per-view was a financial success as it equaled this year's Mania buy rates. Fuck. 550,000. That's wow. insane. Um, but it is down 25k from last year's SummerSlam. All right, let's bring it to the Wrestling is Awesome segment. Let's have a look at... Suburban Commando. You can go huzzah. Huzzah! <laughs> awesome! Going up. Going down. Stop! He's mine. It's been nice knowing you, Shep. There'll be others. Goody, goody. If the men in the moon looked out on this place, take a seat. I said, take a seat. Oh, funny. That's real funny. I was frozen today! Oh, what is this, a tag team? You're a dead man, Ramsey. No wonder you guys never talk. All right, and that'll do it for this week, folks. Great show, Lance, as always. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching and listening. Um, any, any two senses, really, you know. <laughs> Don't smell. <laughs> <laughs> or fluff me. <laughs> <laughs> Next time on OSW Review, it's the seminal Survivor Series. Full of semen. <laughs> <laughs> we have the fucking amazing Survivor, 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 Survivor Series match. Oh, it's awesome. And a massive debut and a giant egg that might just hatch. <laughs> it's the 1990 Survivor Series and it is chocked full of awesome balls. So remember, you can catch all of our shows, fuck, free of charge and an IMAX flavored four to three full screen at oswreview.com and subscribe to us via iTunes at itunes.oswreview.com So it's a goodbye from Mr. OOC 
V1, Raptor, and myself, Jay Hunter. And remember, a winner is you. You know the way uh, we always do a little, we just chat away about rubbish after, and then the, the, <laughs> the credits, credits roll. He loves that because then he gets to put something in the credits. So today, <laughs> and, I know, rubber, rubber. And, I, and I know he's going to put this in, but I, I was going to say, we're not going to say anything today. And I know he's putting that in so it defeats the whole purpose. <laughs> like the inception of credit roll. This is amazing, isn't it? This is like a taco inside a burger in a KFC. <laughs> Sorry, what's Tito song? <laughs> nice. Brother Love, as unaccustomed as you are to public speaking, I'm going to give you the opportunity to wrap things up here for SummerSlam Fever. Well, well, well thank you, Brother Me. You know, and I want to take this time to tell all my brothers and sisters out there just how much I love you and how much I know that each and every one of you... Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Everything's turned black in here. I mean, hey, hey, turn the power back. Hey, my, my, Brother Me, where are you going? Hey, come, come on. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is for the Intercontinental Championship, scheduled for one fall. Introducing first, the challenger, to be accompanied to the ring by his perfect manager, Bobby the Brain Heenan, weighing 257 pounds. For him to repeat as the Intercontinental Champion. And if anybody can do it, he certainly can. Aside from the brand, and I don't think he has one fan here. From Denton, Texas. Weighing 254 pounds, the Intercontinental Champion, the Texas Tornado! Ranging his way down the hall right now, reigning Intercontinental Champion, the Texas Tornado, as I have been joined here on ringside by his Lordship, Alfred Hayes. This guy's on fire, your Lordship. Yes, I just came from the dressing room. Knocking over tables, kicking down chairs. He cannot wait for this moment to have the chance to get his belt back. Now well, there it is, the goal. That's what it's all about. Texas Tornado couldn't wait to sign that contract, your lordship, that return clause contract. He wants to prove something too. Yes, definitely. You know, I got a chance to see. Oh, this look out! We're underway. <laughs> Mr. Perfect didn't want to wait for anything. Didn't even want to give the champ a chance to get in the ring. Wow! Close line sends him right out over the top. What did I tell you, Gorilla? Isn't he really psyched up here? Isn't he on fire, this man? The he challenger is. Finally got that beautiful ring rope off. Paid a price in doing it. Both men look superbly fit to me, Gorilla. Their conditioning is so important in such an important match. Well, if this thing goes an hour, they'll both still be there. They right definitely here. will. Just look at these young men. Just look at the back of the Texas tornado there. And the sculpted body of the battle. Well, turned around now. Got caught on the outside wall. Well, that was a little twister on the outside there, Gorilla. Certainly was. A sort of a half a tornado, but it was enough to put Mr. Perfect down. And indeed, he's staggering around on his feet now. Heenan doesn't like it. Doesn't like what he's seen. 
I think their game plan just went out the window. I think it did. And it went right out of Mr. Perfect's head because he was really stunned and hurt and shaken up by that tremendous blow from the tornado. Another one. A big weasel champ gone out here. Wow, now out over the top. Right onto our broadcast table comes Mr. Perfect. Things going awry here for the brain. We're definitely in a danger zone here. Perfect going around to the opposite exit. Stay over there. The weather has erupted as far as the flawless one is concerned because the tornado is right on top of his man here. Oh, look at the arm ringer here. Look at the leverage and force behind it. Tornado pushing as much as he can in the early stages of this match to try and establish his, establish his authority. And indeed, he is completing that particular task. You know, your lordship, I've been around here at the Ronda World Wrestling Federation for quite a number oh. of years. And I've seen a lot of Intercontinental Champions come and go, but nobody is happier about having that title than the Texas Tornado. No, he is really a thrilling man to watch, and he himself is thrilled by the possession of that title. It's something he's been wanting all his life, and he's achieved it. What a dream come true. Brain says we're going to see the title change hands here tonight in the Garden. Wouldn't surprise me. Well, it certainly wouldn't surprise me, having been in the dressing room of the flawless one. Oh, sleeper by the tornado! Notice how quickly perfect move to the side there. Great defense. Forced him back into the corner. Whoa! Wow! Reverse knife edge of beauty. They heard that one over on Lexington. Wow! Snap! Next snap. Perfect's got all the moves. He certainly has, and Texas Tornado has taken a lot of punishment at the hands of Mr. Perfect. The point is, how much can the challenger throw up to the champion without, at the moment, forting at all? Well, he had a half a stump puller there. If he'd have stepped over, he uh, had a good submission hole to deal with, but chose not to. As we hear the weasel chant go out once again. Wow. Perfect got everything behind that shot. He's measuring them now. Don't take too many of those to the jaw to make you wish you were somewhere else. A little more discipline being shown now by Mr. Perfect. He started off at a blistering pace. And really, uh, Texas Tornado matched him speed for speed. But now he's beginning to pick his shots a little better. I think both guys looking for a knockout punch here, your lordship. They're loading up. They certainly are. Right over the brain uh, of the shoulder of the weasel. Nice shot by our number seven handheld. Or was that eight? I, seven. I, my arithmetic isn't too good. Oh, God. referee! Oh, what a play. Got nailed right in a corner. Oh, got nailed again. Oh, right to the temple. That shot of the referee. He's down. He's out. He is out. The match continues on. Perhaps we'll get a different referee come in here or some kind of assistance. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, Tornado made a mistake there. He went to look at the referee to give him some sort of aid. And that gave the perfect opportunity for Mr. Perfect. He's over the super. Perfect Plex. Perfect Plex coming up. He nailed him with it. There's nobody to count. And that's two. Three. That's about a ten count already. Four. Look at Heenan. He's trying to get the referee awake. Wow. Bad Three. omen here for Mr. Perfect, your lordship. Well, he's still on top. He still has the uh, upper hand. But he's giving Tornado a little chance to recover here. Just took off that top turnbuckle pad. Look out. Face first right into the bear steel. Had the referee not been hit and gone down, we would have had a new Intercontinental Champion. And the referee's still down. He hasn't moved. He hasn't stirred at all. Somebody has got to do something here. Texas Tornado hasn't moved either. 
Over again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Referee just starting to make some movements now. And here he comes. A tornado is completely out after that head blow to the unguarded turnbuckle at the top. Tornado hasn't moved a muscle. Referee not really conscious. This is just instant yes, he here. Is. He's got it. Two count. He could have counted the ten already. No, no. two count. Doesn't get the three. Oh, look at perfect. Is he bent out of shape or what? And the brain as well. Wow. A tornado! He hit him with it! Oh, what a beauty, too! Referee still in Grog City. And again! And oh, oh, oh. Oh, over the top and out! Action's gone to the outside now. Referee counting. Both men fighting. This match would have been over a long time ago, your lordship. But we'd, have had, would. we'd have had a new champion had the referee yes, stayed yes. on his feet. One of them has got to get back in, surely. Count continues. Oh, reversal. Oh, oh right into that town buckle. Hit it. Perfect into the steel post. The bell is rung. Tornado's back. And back just in time, I believe. We'll have to wait a minute here until the referee can get over there. And give the decision to our ring announcer. I, I believe we have it now. Here is the referee's official decision. He has counted both men out of the ring. The result of this bout, a double 